difficulties that we face at times in surgeries and it would be nice to see what everybody does during those situations and to uh, share those situations in some form. I don't have those extreme dramatic situations which maybe five person is looking at, but uh, we just go through some of the, uh, the more common issues with the PBR surgery that we face, which is essentially sometimes there's a <coughs> when you feel there is a bleed which occurs and how we manage it, or if there's an hypertonic break uh, which forms when we are feeling. So I'll just show uh, a couple of such situations which are there. Uh, this is a situation where, as you can see, there are proliferations in this traction. There's a PRRD kind of a situation where uh, we are trying to use multiple, you kind of remove the vitreous and then assess the hyaloidal attachments with the cutter. This is 20, I mean, 25 gauge, which you see, which uh, usually insinuates um, quite easily through a lot of planes uh, between the membranes or the hyaloid. And then you have to assess if the, if the adhesion is very strong, then you need to. Uh, stop pulling at that stage and rather than cutting and segmenting rather than uh, just keep pulling. So, so we assess that and remove as much of the hyaloidal attachments as you see. And then again trying to assess, you are gently pulling but at some point I feel that um, it's probably uh, too adherent and I leave it at that stage. Uh, and then again there was a connection here which I pulled and then a bleed started uh, at this stage. And uh, you want me to stop? I just wanted that if you have a situation like this, we stop and then discuss uh, uh, what can be done or what does not do in such situations when uh, active bleed starts. Uh, see here because it's a PRRD with a, uh, a lot of jumping up in the central area so I put perforocarbon just to open up um, that area and see that uh, and then to assess how I can stop the bleed or localize the bleed of some sort so that's what just wanted to make up he's made an extremely important point that uh, put a small bubble of perfluorocarbon over the macula because otherwise you will without uh, you knowing it a trickle of blood may go submacularly and then this is very sticky uh, blood in diabetics. So you yeah. have hell of a time trying to... Yeah, it very fast starts getting sticky in that sense. So as you can see, again, I mean, did a bit of perfluorocarbons to kind of push, <laughs> push back the blood to some extent and localize it. And now you can see that the area which uh, I finally, the main source of traction which I was earlier trying to pull has also formed a small hole there and you could see some viscous fluid coming in and the bleed also started from there. So I diaphragmized uh, those areas and all this while you uh, constantly play between once there is an active bleed going on, raise the pressure but then lower it within a minute or so because otherwise you, you tend to sometimes uh, uh, keep the pressure high for too long and that's not good for the eye. So you can see that in, this is the sticky blood is started to form. But the lucky part is because I put perfluorocarbon, the actual macula and the fovea did not get the brunt of it. But see, it eventually starts to dribble down again and, and this is the sticky blood we were talking about. So so once a bleed starts and no matter what you uh, do, you do take all these precautions and steps but still this is one of those situations where you end up with this uh, mild sticky blood which at some point you need to leave although it's clear of the fovea. And the main thing you need to ensure is that you've done a good uh, 360 PRP barrage because that's what finally you want to achieve as a regression. And also stop all active bleeders at the end of surgery. So this eventually would clear up, although you would have liked to leave even uh, without the presence of this blood. But still at some point you need to balance and leave it rather than you keep pulling, I might create another break there and that would start bleeding and then it's under air and you need to shift back. And it, it's a constant cycle and it will just prolong the surgery. So it's at some point you need to realize that okay, this is 
what I can clear and then stop the active bleeder, that's what you need to ensure. Do good laser and then uh, stop the surgery at that stage. Manish, one question. You achieved excellent visualization. Uh, what are your tips for such good visualization of uh, I mean, I use the wide angle for all. I use a contact based system. So, I mean, one is that, that you have a full view. So, even if a hose is coming from one area and you raise the pressure, so uh, most of the time, if you raise it to 60, the bleed will instantly stop uh, increasing. You know, whatever is collected will be there, and that you can go and aspirate to some extent. So, but if you sometimes, you know, what happens that there are three, four areas of proliferation, so you feel something and a small bleed starts. You ignore it, you go to the other one, you say, Let's me, let me finish all this and, um, and then I'll go and diathermize. But then that trickle keeps on increasing and, and it reaches a stage where you're compromising your visibility while feeling and you you just, you know, are too impatient at that stage to come out and uh, do that. So I think that is something we need to be conscious of. Even if a small bleeder is there, make an effort to raise pressure, take a diathermy or, or a laser also you can use right over a, a bleeder which is flat, stop it, uh, get the pressure back, then go and do the rest of the thing. Because I've learned that lesson very times. you know in a hurry we sometimes say, okay, like, it's a small bleed, let it be, and uh, you keep on going on with the surgery. And then suddenly the whole view gets uh, fuzzy. And then you can land up with problems or then it takes you longer to clear up and, and then find all the sources of bleeders. So that's what uh, I do. One or two points I'll make since we are on this topic of diabetic vitreatinine bleeding. Number one is, uh, uh, you know, usually I keep these diabetic cases as the first case of the day. Because I've burnt my fingers, you know, I've, I've sometimes kept as a fourth or fifth case and had this bleeder and then my assistant tell me that he used up all the antibodies in the morning. Yeah. You know, so I usually keep these cases first. When, when you're tackling a membrane, the diabetic membrane, it's maybe sometimes very useful to tell the uh, your assistant to keep the cautery ready because those few seconds which you waste sometimes, you know, you're taking the exchanging instruments also that sometimes you can just cauterize the bleeder there and there. And yeah. another thing, since you're talking about it, um, you know, the, what happens is when you see a bleeder, you raise pressure, you come out, bring out your cutter and put in your diathermy, and there is a time lapse. When you go back, the ooze has slightly increased, although all that has become less because now we use valve cannulas, all those things. So you know that transition period is not creating an outflow or a, or a, or a low pressure situation, which previously was a big factor. So, but there's still you lose those few seconds and there's a mild ooze which has covered the actual source of bleed and now you're again struggling to find way to that from there. So I'm sure all of you face that you go in and then again you have to take your cutter, clean it up, then again try the same thing. So, another thing one could do in today's time, I mean, a lot of surgeries use chandelier and some people now start using it as a routine. So, if you actually have a chandelier in, you could have your cutter inside, you don't need your light pipe, so you could have your diaphragm in your other hand. So, as you are clearing, you can aspirate and go right there instead of that time lapse of a cutter coming out and the diaphragm is going in. So, for bad cases, I think such uh, adjuncts during the surgery can also help uh, reduce all these. One more thing, you know, which I've found uh, helpful at times is this huge, large fibrovascular membrane sitting on the macula. I finish my peripheral laser first, and right. then I go and dissect the membranes. Because there have been situations, not so many, but few, where you know a lot of periodontal yeah, laser you can't laser. You can't, and yeah. I'm really using oil just for the tamponade and doing it as a second step later on. Yeah. But if you know if during that time, if you've done your laser, yeah, finish sure. it, then maybe you will achieve more better hemostasis there. So uh, I prefer to do this lasering, I mean, provided there's no big hemorrhage and retina is, uh, and whatever attached portions of the retina, I prefer to do it free of. Because somehow intra-op, if I did laser in initially, the amount of bleeding during dissection is likely to be more. Uh, one more important point which uh, Manish brought out is that if a break thread gets created, don't stop over there and get paralyzed. Go on, complete your dissection. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Exactly. The viscous uh, subretinal fluid acts as a sort of third hand in fact to prevent the retina from uh, flapping around. So the worst thing one can do at that time is to in fact try to drain the subretinal fluid because a break has been created. Please. You go to the next one. Okay, this is another uh, similar situation where as you can see that there is probably 
which again we are with the situation with the ischemic uh, retina. I just uh, go with uh, It's not the same thing, right? I'm confused when I put three or four together. No, this is different. So I was, I removed some of those proliferations and then I'm again assessing this area in the central part again. Like the previous case, this part of the attachment is a bit stiff and you can see that wherever I pull it tends to uh, show a strong adhesion. So I'm very gently trying to, I didn't pull finally at it, but still some of those areas have started to bleed, uh, just like we talked about in the previous case. And this is like the disc, so it actually becomes more difficult. You need to be cautious. Just trim that uh, proliferation, but you cannot go uh, deeper because you can see that there is this whole constricting membranes here and yeah, the location of the actual disc is again hidden by all that. But slowly as you can see, the same principles we discussed, I raised pressure, I cleaned up that area. Uh, there was a lot of bleeding from this particular attachment which was crumpling up, so eventually all the diathermy and everything stopped. But again, by the end of the surgery, there are these uh, these are typical cases where some ooze from somewhere, even though you keep trying, keeps coming in and then it, it spills over to this area. So the aim at the end of the surgery is that you need to clear up as much of this residual blood which is there, stop active bleeding, uh, make sure your laser is done, like Pritam said sometimes if you feel, uh, maybe finish the laser before uh, when you contemplate such things. Uh, but if it's a TRRD, sometimes the retina is not attached for you to do that. But if it's a flat retina, you could definitely do that so that it saves you time uh, eventually to do uh, uh, finish. Manish, what are the parameters you were using uh, for doing the cut rate operation? <coughs> I use the highest cut rate available. I use the constellation, so it's either it's at 5000. Uh, 7,500 is not yet available. We did try some prototype. Uh, while doing the delamination with the cutter? Uh, the suction for, and the... Uh, for every, I actually, uh, the three settings on the machine I keep as the highest cut rate, the highest vacuum, which is 650. But vacuum is on linear control. So you're not uh, all the time using the 650. You could be at 100, you could be at 200. But it's in your control. You, know, it's, you just press the foot pedal as much as you need. So the cutter, cut rate is always the highest. Uh, you could lower it if you feel there's a thick proliferation, which is taking a bit longer if you feel... Um, I would then lower the cut rate to maybe two, uh, 3000 and then see if that's more effective for a certain uh, uh, stiffer proliferation. But otherwise, I keep 5000 to begin with and a full vacuum to, uh, to be used at, at your convenience. You know, you, when you're working very close to retina, you want very low vacuum, so you could be at 50 only. You know, you, you just press a slight. Uh, are there any tips you would suggest uh, to all of us uh, that the uh, retina doesn't get caught uh, into the tip? Yes, yeah, the same thing. Problem? I mean, use the highest cut. I mean, and I, I think the biggest tip is that don't have too many settings. You know, in the past we used to always think that for a core and for a diabetic case use this, for a uh, retina detachment use this settings, for a lensectomy use this setting. I mean, they all give you some clue, but I don't think today I look at a lot of variability in settings. I just keep highest cut rate, highest vacuum as a preset, but the vacuum is in, uh, is up to you to use whatever. If you are working close to retina, you need very low vacuum, but the highest cut rate is, is a must. When you are working in the core area, and if you feel your speed is low, which usually with the new generation of machine is not a problem, you could lower the cut rate uh, uh, just to achieve a still higher flow uh, that you might like, but otherwise I don't switch it uh, for that purpose at all. Just keep the highest settings available on your machine. It makes the job simpler because otherwise in between surgery you want an assistant to keep changing it. Uh, it really does not make that much difference to change the parameters at all. One, 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 one last point I'd yeah. to make and I still nowadays we are using our cutters for as for and scissors, you know, and they are working fantastically. But still I sometimes find the utility of biomanual retreat and also really helps you. Know? When I look back at my videos, I see in those cases where I have switched to biomanual in between or at, at late, you know, when there's already a lot of heat collected on the retina under the membrane. You know, those don't, the biomanual, you know, you've done it at a point where already the wall is lost, the battery is lost. But when you planned with the biomanual right in the beginning of the surgery, you know, you know sort of swallowed your yeah. own wall in the biomanual. Yeah. I think that they make sense. In terms of hemostasis, yeah. not making hydrogen yes. brains. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you very much, Manish. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you.